Welcome to episode 76 of the AAEM RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. This episode is a recording of a live webinar that took place on September 14, 2020. In this episode, Brian Redman, AAEM RSA Northeastern Regional Representative, interviews Lauren Lamparder, AAEM RSA Medical Student Council President, Brianna Beaver, AAEM RSA Western Regional Representative, Joshua Sawyer, AAEM RSA Southern Regional Representative, and AAEM RSA Board Members, Drs. Gabriel Stahl, Gregory Jasani, and Ryan Gibney. Today, AAEM RSA leadership discussed the EM clerkship. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Redman. I'm a second year medical, first year graduate and DPhD student at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. I am the Northeastern representative on the AAEM RSA uh, Medical Student Council. Uh, I'm really happy so many of you all could join us tonight for another RSA Monday webinar. This Monday's title is Ask Me Anything About the EM Clerkship. Today, we hope to create a low stake space for you to learn about the medical student EM clerkship experience. So feel free to drop any questions you may have in the chat and I'll do my best to get them asked. Uh, I'm joined by a host of emergency medicine fanatics and various years of their training. Um, so, you know, we'll begin by letting them introduce themselves and say a bit about their clerkship experience. Uh, also including the amount of clerkships they've done, the locations where they completed those clerkships, and any other emergency medicine training that you've received. Um, so let's begin with Lauren. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I'm the AEMRSA Medical Student Council President, and I'm a current fourth-year medical student at Loyola uh, University Chicago's Stritch School of Medicine. I'm applying to emergency medicine this next year, and I just completed my uh, emergency clerkship two weeks ago, only one this year because of COVID. Wow, so you're fresh. You're fresh off of your clerkship experience. Uh, what about you, Brianna? Hey, everyone. I'm Brianna. I'm the AAEM RSA Medical Student Western Regional Representative. I go to medical school at Western University down in Pomona, California, and I just also finished my clerkship on Friday um, at UCSF Brett Snow. Wow, so all the information is fresh. Uh, let's turn it over to Gabriel. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriel Stahl. I'm a third year resident, uh, chief resident at uh, Brookdale University Medical Center Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. I did, f- I did four clerkships, so I was on the high side, but I'm also an IMG. So if there's any IMGs out there, you can answer questions about that. I did all of my clerkships in the New York City area, um, Lincoln Hospital, Elmhurst, Brooklyn Hospital Center, and Maimonides. Great. Good to know. What about you, Josh? Hey, I'm uh, Josh Sawyer. I'm a uh, fourth-year medical student at the Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine, and I have completed a clerkship at my community hospital, a virtual clerkship with the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and then I'm uh, in the middle of a clerkship with the military um, up in Norfolk, Virginia. So uh, kind of a varied, weird experience there. That weird experience will serve this panel well. Uh, what about you, Greg? Hey, everyone. My name is Greg. I'm a third year emergency uh, medicine resident at the University of Maryland. I went to medical school at George Washington, and I did clerkships there at Christiana Care in Wilmington, Delaware, which is also where I'm from originally, and at Jefferson in Philly. Great. Good to hear. And last but not least, Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan Gibney. I'm a third year chief resident at UC Irvine. Uh, I did my clerkships at Irvine and UCSF Fresno back in 17. But it's good to, to meet everyone, uh, attendees. Um, it seems like you know who's, who's here, who's at the table. So we've got folks with a diverse array of experience at all different labels in their training. Uh, so let's get the chat going uh, with your questions and uh, any things you may have about the EM clerkship. Uh, to begin things off, though, I've got a question. Uh, what preparation did you do prior to beginning the EM clerkship? Man, I, I prepared a lot. So... I, um, I have this like bullet point list that I made before, um, before my clerkships ever started. 
and I would look at it all the time, like obsessively just to make sure that I was like staying true to what I wrote. But I'll just pick like one bullet point since there's so many of us, but one that I, that I really thought stuck out, I had a checklist. So there's a, if anyone's familiar with Ruben Strayer, he has a website called EM updates and he has a checklist to go through um, for every emergency room. So uh, when you come to my program, medical students, um, have to do this checklist, not his checklist, but a checklist. And I don't know that every program does, um, but if you use his checklist and get there, you have to get there a little early, like 15, 20 minutes early to go through this checklist, you're gonna know where all this stuff is and be ready to, to help when anything comes, um, comes in the door at the emergency room. So, um, but that's just one thing that I thought was always helpful. Like I'd, I'd come in and I'd like do this checklist and know where everything is in the ED. So a little bit uh, about me prior to med school, I was an ER flight nurse. So I, I had emergency medicine experience. So I felt a little uh, comfortable with the uh, department and the environment, but I would still encourage anybody who has prior experience to um, not just rest on your laurels and uh, assume that you uh, are prepared um, because it's different when you're on the medical student side and the, the physician side of the desk. So I, uh, I actually listened to a podcast um, called EM Clerkship. Uh, I can't remember right now the physician who does that, but it's a great, if you like podcasts, if you like listening to things while you run or you're doing other, other stuff, it's a great way to get just like the basic presentations down. And he started transitioning into doing uh, oral board type scenarios where you run through a clinical case. And I think that that's really helpful to uh, help you flesh out some of those ideas. In addition to that, um, I would uh, give a shout out to the ALEM uh, Bridge to EM curriculum. Um, it's, uh, you can go to, I think it's literally like ALEM, if you just Google ALEM Bridge to EM curriculum, it's set up for fourth year medical students to kind of bridge that gap between what may be your typical uh, ward experiences uh, versus the realities in the emergency department. Um, but it's a mix of podcasts and uh, kind of short web articles and blog posts uh, about common and critical presentations in the emergency department. I think it, it pays a lot of dividends to, to, to go through that. I think it's divided into like four or five weeks, but you can kind of pick and choose and prepare yourself how you, you best see fit. I think that's a great piece of advice. I used um, EM Basic Clerkship, or uh, EM Basic Clerkship, I think, or EM Basic Podcast, a uh, similar type of thing where it goes through common complaints and kind of the differentials. I focus mostly on Kind of reviewing broad differentials for um, different illnesses that we would see. I had just come off of surgery too, so time was a little short to prepare. Um, but yeah, I just spent some time like to re reviewing how to do a presentation, um, patient presentation. There's some good videos for that uh, through different EM websites and different EM podcasts are a great resource. Yeah, I'll echo the EM basic. I use that for kind of my honing in on what to focus on within the emergency department. And then I think the best resource is those that have gone before you. I think that your first year residents and your uh, outgoing MS4 from your programs last year are really gonna give you uh, a kind of a robust feel of what their clerkships were like at different hospitals. I understand that right now is a definitely a different time that for all of you guys getting ready to apply now as far as being able to you know, go to multiple programs and get a feel for how different residents work in different places. But talk to those colleagues that have come before you that have gone on to different places and find out what they found was helpful, what wasn't helpful, um, what they liked and didn't like. Uh, echoing what Gabe said, you know, having a checklist and getting yourself really familiarized with the emergency room setting um, from the minute you hit the ground is very, very uh, noticed. Um, when a student comes in ready to work, they know the layout of the land, they know what's expected of them. Um, and then really brush up on your communication skills. I think that, you know, uh, Lauren touched on like the three minute presentation is a good article you can read. Um, EM Basic and Alien both have topics on this as well, where you really hone in on what is, is the focal point of your presentation and what you think is going on and become more of a data synthesizer rather than a data gatherer. Um, Cause that's really focal in emergency medicine cause something's critical going on. You need to be able to recognize it quickly and articulate that to whoever you're, you're speaking with about the care plan it kind of readily and, and having a, a plan in your head. Um, and then finally, I think with the communication, um, 
you know, be present and, you know, uh, be interject yourself into the situations without being um, over the top. So um, emergency medicine is very fast paced. A lot of us are kind of moving at the speed of 25 things going on at once. And sometimes it's very easy if you're just kind of wallflower um, to get lost in that mix. So don't be afraid to be assertive without being, you know, like, like I said, arrogant or aggressive um, with it. So you make yourself present and a useful part of the department and knowing we can trust you and say, hey, I need this from you. And you're like, I got it. And you go on and do it. Yeah, I agree with all of those things. I used EM basic and EM clerkship for both of my podcasts. And I just listened to those when I was driving towards like the end of third year before March, before things got a little weird. And then I also talked to other people, you know, cause normally you do a couple of rotations and that, you know, you for your first one, you're kind of just getting your feet wet, but when you only have one, you have to, you know, get information from other people as far as, you know, what should I be doing? What is it like? Um, you know, ask them those kinds of questions and the people in the class right above me were really helpful about that because they rotated at so many different places. So I was able to get a lot of information, but I would say that the information I got was very similar. Um, and it's pretty much everything that everybody has already said. I would just like to add one more thing. Um, check out the slow before if you have, haven't already. I mean, I was obsessed with it. So I looked at it a long, long time before, but a slow is also a good thing because that is exactly what they're, what they're looking at. So Look at the topics on the slow. Make sure that you are trying to fulfill those those points. So it seems like we um, we as a panel use a variety of resources uh, from podcasts to different books uh, to different checklists. Um, specifically, were there any resources that you either subscribed to or anything you kept like in your pocket or on hand that you felt was super duper useful for your clerkship? I just kept the EMRA, it's the little booklet. I forget what it's called. It's not like the antibiotic guide, but it's just like the EMRA. It has the little booklet and it has all the little different, it has all the different complaints in it. And you can just flip to a page like abdominal pain and it'll kind of tell you, you know, what your workup should be, um, you know, things that you should consider serious versus not so serious. And then I also just pulled up Wiki EM. Uh, on any computer that I was on or life in the fast lane, I would kind of go back and forth just depending on if I felt like it gave enough information or not enough, I would, I would go back and forth. But those, I, I think I used wiki EM and life in the fast lane more because it was on my computer where I was like looking at the patient information, but I did also keep that Emra book on me. Um, but I would say that I used probably the wiki EM and life in the fast lane a little more. So yeah, as the, as the senior resident, one of the senior residents on the call, I still use Wiki EM um, pretty much every shift I work. So that definitely does not go away and it's a great resource and it saved my skin on shift more times than I care to count. Another resource that I really like is press. Yep. Gabe has it on his phone. I've got it on mine too. And I like, that's the first uh, tab I open when I sit down at my computer. Um, I also really like presser decks. It's also from Emra. It's available as a book also as an app. Um, it, it's really good. It gives you meds and more importantly, doses. Um, and you can break it down based on type of med or diagnoses, which is usually what I use it for. And it's really good, I would imagine, for med students. Um, if someone's asking you, you know, oh, what would you give and how much for, say, SVT? You can just quickly pull up in that app, look, it'll give you dose, med, and route. And it's a great resource. And it's something I still use every day as well, in addition to WikiM, which is fantastic. For those of you guys that aren't aware, I echo the Emra uh, little books are great. Um, they've actually moved it to an online platform, which you can subscribe to. And it's all based within an app, which is nice. It's a single app. Um, I've unlocked a few of them. It can get a little pricey, especially for med students out there that, you know, just are allocating their resources. I echo Wiki EM. MD Calc is another one and PD Stat that I have on mine that I use quite a bit. Um, I think we all do as well. But yeah, I think that there's not an ever a time that my second screen doesn't have Wiki EM when I'm working a shift. Yeah, I always have uh, MD Calc um, on my phone uh, just because you use so many clinical decision tools in the emergency department. But uh, in addition to that, um, kind of not on shift, but the MRAP uh, C3 series, I think is really good about uh, teaching you those common uh, critical clinical situations. 
So if you're on your clerkship and, you know, looking for something to listen to on your way home so you don't fall asleep after that night shift, um, it's a it's a great uh, resource. But I don't use the IMRA antibiotic guide because I felt like uh, it was a little too uh, basic um, and I didn't really, I'm not uh, super intelligent when it comes to antibiotics. So um, I had a physician, uh, an attending uh, ER doc recommend uh, the Samford guide, <laughs> which I actually really like. And uh, he told me that if you want to learn how to really prescribe antibiotics to use it. So I think it, I think it's behind a paywall. I think you have like a $30 annual fee, but uh, I've learned a lot just from looking up stuff on that uh, antibiotic wise. I used a lot of the same resources that everyone has talked about. One that didn't get mentioned was an app called emergency medicine ultrasound that I really like. Um, if you're ever trying to do any bedside ultrasounds, it gives you direct instructions of what you should be looking for, how you should aim the probe and like what, you would see if you see the thing you're actually looking for, which is really helpful when you're learning how to do that. I would add a shameless plug that if you're an RSA member, you also have access to our PDF ultrasound guide. I'm, I'd like I'm to second that. Fun. It's really good. It's uh, it's very simple, straightforward. I've used it a lot. There's a ton of resources out here, and I'm, I'm sitting here jotting down things myself. Uh, the Stanford Guide for Antibiotics, the WikiM, Life in the Fast Lane, the Emerbrook. Um, make sure you all are taking these notes because these are keys to succeed in all your EM clerkship. A really common question that medical students, no matter what clerkship they're on, but especially for emergency medicine acts is, how do I practice the perfect patient presentation? Would anyone like to share some of their tips for doing that? I think you need to know, to, to get an idea of presenting first. Um, as far as, uh, as someone mentioned watching a video, EM and five has a great video that goes over the presentation. Um, there's also the article that Ryan mentioned, patient presentation, I think in three minutes. I would also add that part of that is getting in and out of the room in a good amount of time. I can't tell you how often I send a medical student to see a patient and they are gone, like just gone, 30 minutes. Wait, I'm like, hey, where's this patient? Like, I could barely sit in my chair that long while I'm waiting. So a lot of time I have to go, but really try to to be mindful that you want to be in and out of that room in, I would say, 10 minutes as a medical student. You can get a lot of the history you need, even without doing a focus history, though, though you want to do focused, but we're always going to expect that you tell us a little more because of, because of your level of training. But I would say just like anything that you do, Practicing with someone else, like for the interview trail or for anything, you could practice saying it out loud with someone else. Though, if that someone else is, um, is not a seasoned um, emergency medicine provider, then they may not be able to give you the finer points of that. So if at all possible, practice with someone who's um, like a resident or an attending mentor, so, you know, someone you have that, that would be able to give you those points. But if not, just watch the video and try to very closely um, mirror what, what they're doing like EM and five. Yeah, and building off of uh, what Gabe said, I'd say always think about when you're presenting, you know, is what you're saying relevant? Everyone keeps throwing around the three minute presentation and there's actually a lot of truth to that. I don't know if anyone else uh, feels this way, but if for me, if something lasts longer than three minutes, my eyes tend to start to glaze over and my mind starts wandering and I start thinking about other things. Um, and that's really a function of how quickly the emergency department moves and the need to just kind of get one thing taken care of so you can move on to the next thing. But I, I just spent the past few months uh, with a bunch of fourth year med students in my department. And the most common thing that I noticed, and I think this is by virtue of they're just, they're new to being fourth years, this was their first EM rotation was that they would kind of give these more formal presentations that I, I think were kind of modeled after how they were taught to give them in med school. They'd include things like every surgery the person had ever had and every home med the person took. And, you know, if it's really not relevant to the person or the chief complaint or what's bringing them into my emergency department right then and there, you really don't need to tell me, um, you know, if someone comes in with belly pain, do I really care about that knee that knee surgery they had in 2006? Not really, but if their chief complaint is knee pain, then yeah, I wanna know it. Um, but just you know, thinking about what do I need to say to get my point across about what I think is going on and what can I you know, leave and leave out? And if it's something that you know, your, your physician or your resident wants to know, they'll ask you. 
um, but try to, as much as you can, synthesize what's relevant and what can kind of wait till later or just not be mentioned at all. Obviously, after one EM rotation, I have not perfected the presentation, but- I have an, I have an author, don't worry. <laughs> Some of the feedback that I've got from different physicians that I worked with, first of all, every physician you work with, I feel like has a different style that they like in a sense, or they have like one little nuance that's different. So that's fine. And the first time that you present to them, they'll tell you, and then, you know, just try and each time after that, that you work with them, if they have this one specific thing that they want to know and try and add that in. And the other feedback that I got was, um, not reading off your paper. So, you know, present it to them like you're talking to them. And, you know, it's hard sometimes when it is a lot of information, but I think it it's easier for them to listen if you're looking at them and being like, hey, so like blah, 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 blah. And instead of just like reading it directly from your paper, that was some feedback that I got, so. And from also just very quickly being on uh, rotation recently, one of the things I noticed was that if I had taken time to choose my three top differentials and one lab, one image, and one other study or consult that I needed, that really kept me organized because it gave me the, the end goal, which directed the whole other presentation. So always have the end goal in mind when you're kind of structuring in your head your presentation because it should reach the same conclusion that you are trying to get the doctor to understand. I think echoing on what Lauren said and a lot what Gabriel said, you know, when you go into that room, you should have those top emergent differentials in your mind walking in based on their chief complaint. Um, I think the EM basic kind of does a good job of kind of pointing in the right direction on what questions to ask. So you should be tailoring your interview to kind of rule in, rule out certain differentials based on that chief complaint. It'll make you much more efficient in gathering that important history to determine what's actually going on and, and how far you think the workup needs to go based on, you know, all of those factors. If you have a 22 year old chest pain versus a 65 year old chest pain, you know, your, your questions to those people are going to be extremely different. And just having that in your mind, rather than just starting blind saying, okay, chest pain, when did it start? And then by the time you're done, you've got, you know, 20 years of history and you have to filter through it. But if you pre-filter your questions, you're going to be much more focused and get in and out quickly with the relevant information and make the enough decisions to, to move forward. Yeah, I really like both what uh, Ryan and Lauren said here. Uh, in the military, it reminds me, we have a uh, saying uh, that's called bluff and it stands B B L U F and it's bottom line up front. So whenever we get a briefing or something, it'll, there'll be a bluff, you know, too long, don't read uh, posting at the top. And I think that that's a good way uh, personally that I like to approach it. I feel a little silly commenting on this, having uh, not as much experience as all the residents on here, but um, if you, if you are coming up with that bottom line up front and then um, filling in the pertinent information and then also remembering that it's a, it's a dynamic environment and situ situational awareness is pretty key in the emergency department. So um, if you're, you know, the residents just coming out or the attendings just coming out of a, a code, maybe not the best time to, you know, hit them with uh, the presentation on the uh, knee pain for 10 years um, that you're not going to do anything for the emergency department tonight. Um, but also, you know, if you are concerned about somebody, um, even if you don't know how to quantify that or say that, I think it's important, uh, even as a medical student to say like, you know, I, this is going on. I think I'm concerned. Maybe I'll should uh, pay attention or come, come check them out. Um, I think it, sometimes it can be hard to find that confidence, um, especially on your first rotation, but um, to, to not be afraid of that and, uh, and, and to just uh, say it like it is. Don't go spend 10 minutes in a room if a patient is sick. If you go in there and that patient looks sick, even if they're not, no one's ever going to care that you said, hey, I think this patient's sick, come check them out. If they're just acting or something, you know, is, is regular to us, but irregular to you, no one is ever no one should ever say anything um, bad to you about that. Yeah, and echo echoing what Josh said, I think the bottom line up front, um, I think that as you grow in your residency, I think most of my presentations start with, this is non-concerning chest pain, here's why. Or especially with your consultants, um, for if your attendings are having you call the consultants, you know, I'm concerned about, you know, CAD on this patient to the cardiology consultant, and then you tell them why, 
you get to that bottom line. So you get their attention of why you're calling them rather than telling them, this is a 54 year old and going through everything you just went through and getting to the question at the end, um, putting that up front, putting your concern up front, I think are, are really um, kind of advanced skills in emergency medicine that, that if you can learn now will serve you very well in your future. It would seem that um, when it comes to preparing for patient presentations, it'd be great to sort of read some articles and watch some videos up front. Um, maybe consolidate your history taking to 10 minutes and, and really think to yourself, is what you're saying relevant? Have your end goal in mind. And then when you're doing that interview, tailor that interview and that presentation to the differences that are most important and how you rule those in and out. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives on patient interviewing. Um, and I, I think now would be a great time to transition to, I guess, the crux of this webinar, talking about the EM clerkship as a whole. Could you all go around and sort of describe your experience on the EM clerkship? Did you work with some of the doctors or specific doctors and, or, or you know, where you floated sometimes? Did you have a primary physician? Were your shift times consistent? Um, could you describe your level of autonomy? So just go into some, you know, some, maybe some anecdotes too about your EM clerkship experience to paint a picture for our attendees. I did two aways, Irvine and, or two rotations, Irvine and Fresno. Um, obviously I liked Irvine enough to stay. Um, so at Irvine, the, the sub I works directly with an attending. So you function as a resident. You don't present to a resident first. You really have a, quite a bit of autonomy and a lot of direction. You know, we've kind of organized it to where you do a first touch and triage, and then we move the med students over to a separate space so they can get a, a more detailed history without, you know, bottlenecking the flow of the triage that goes on. So they do get enough time to kind of act, get an adequate history without being rushed. We expect all of our medical students to follow up on all the results, to call their own consults once you check in with the, the MD, write their own discharge instructions, really function as a true resident. And that was the way it was when I was a med student rotating. It's the way we keep it now. It's been a very positive experience, I think, both on both ends for kind of gaining that autonomy. Um, when I was in Fresno, a lot of the same experience. Fresno is a huge hospital for those who haven't been. I really enjoyed it. Um, they had a really unique thing in Fresno that they did what called teaching shifts. And Jessica Mason from MRAP would run these to where you would come in with four or five of your colleagues that were rotating at the same time, you would cherry pick the list and you would almost do it like a case presentation and discuss the differentials. And then you would all go see the patient together and learn together and then debrief about them. So you'd only see one or two patients your entire eight hour shift, but it was all focused on learning together as a group and kind of getting that feedback. Um, I remember we recorded a an MRAP episode on WPW while I was on shift because a gentleman came in with syncopal episode and was found to have new WPW that was previously diagnosed. So it was really neat to do that on, uh, they really took time out to focus on the learning, which I really enjoyed. Um, the shift wise, um, usually you kind of work an, an even differential between days, swings and nights. And that was true for both sites. Uh, both sites, I would call my own consults, you know, call your own admits and for the most part, kind of have a decent amount of autonomy. And that's pretty much it. I really enjoyed both experiences. I ranked them both very highly. And I think it's good to see that different, um, the different functionality in different hospitals. Each one has their own character. Ultimately, you know, EM, you're gonna get great training wherever you end up. And you'll notice that there's a lot of different personalities and different programs kind of, and have it, its own personality. So. Really think, keep that in mind when you're when you're evaluating these on away rotations. You know how do I fit in this group, um, and see if you can see yourself there. Yeah, so I just finished my rotation at UCSF Fresno, which Ryan was talking about, and I think it's pretty similar to what he was talking about. It's a little bit different now with COVID, just based on the patients you can see and and not. Um, so basically the way my schedule was set up was you had yellow shifts, which were in the red, yellow, and trauma zone. So red is like the most critical, yellow, medium critical, green, uh, you know, least critical. So you had yellow shifts, you had green shifts, and then you had your student shifts. 
I had three student shifts and then I think half and half between yellow and green. So on yellow shifts, you didn't pick up patients for the most part, unless it was pretty slow, but you would just rotate around between the trauma red and yellow zones and you would do procedures or you would, you know, watch recesses or whatever it may be. And then in the green zone was really when you had the opportunity to pick up patients with all the patients that you picked up in green zone, you would pick them up, uh, you know, get your history, you would put in orders and you would save them. And then you would talk to your attending and then they would just sign the orders for you. Or they would say, Oh, well, I want to, you know, I think we should change this one or whatever they thought. Um, and then, yeah, you would call your, all your own consults, like hospitalist surgery, whoever you're talking to. And then for the student shifts, um, I really enjoyed those. I had two student shifts, like Ryan described, where you just cherry picked patients and you would, each person would see like one to two patients, but you would really get to see like six patients all together because you would talk about them all. On one of my student shifts, we actually got to go over to the sim lab and do procedures for like the first half of the day, which was really awesome. And just ask questions and even just like little things that you think, oh, you know, maybe this wouldn't be the best thing to ask the attending on the shift, but you got to ask on the student shift and everyone kind of got to learn from it. As far as um, other than that, my schedule was interesting. I only worked three night shifts and then the rest of my shifts were either 10 to 6 or 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Whereas a lot of people got like the 3 p.m. To, to midnight shift. So I don't know why I preferentially got mornings, but um, that's how my schedule worked out. Um, my clerkship was um, 11 shifts and one um, nursing shift where we did kind of like IVs and blood draws and um, EKGs and things like that, triage patients. Um, and then our 11 shifts were split between an academic center and a county, uh, I mean, a community center, um, kind of just depending on where you were in the alphabet. Um, and it was a wide variety of different times. Um, we worked with a different physician every single shift. Um, we didn't have any of the like student type shifts. They were all kind of, you just picked up patients as they came into your specific pod. And then you'd staff with the attending that you were assigned to that day. And we had um, a bunch of like asynchronous learning where we had different um, experiences in the sim bays. We ran codes in the sim bays and we did a stroke simulation with nursing students and other procedures and things in uh, with the residents. So I've kind of had uh, a couple different experiences. Um, the first one was really more of a uh, rotation at my home hospital because of COVID. Um, so that's you know, there's no residents or anything like that. You're just showing up and uh, whatever crazy shifts and uh, cycles that you're doing, you're doing. And there's no residents, so you get to do a lot and see a lot. And uh, the autonomy is kind of up to the physician you're rotating with. So those can be fun experiences if, uh, if you have the opportunity for those, especially if you're in a busy uh, community hospital like I'm at. But then I had a virtual rotation, um, which was interesting. And I'm sure that that's going to vary by whatever site. So I don't want to put anything out there that um, really colors your vision either way. But um, mine at the University of Alabama, Birmingham was uh, really great. I mean, they've got a, a cool staff there and it was really more of a, um, let's teach you some emergency medicine stuff, run through some oral board type cases and get to know you. Um, so if you are in that situation, if things ramp up and you're uh, looking at virtual clerkships, um, I would highly recommend it. I mean, it really is a great way to get to know um, the people, and, and I can't stress this enough, having worked uh, as a nurse in a residency program, the culture of a place is really important. So just getting to know what the people are like is, uh, is a huge plus. And then I'm currently in my military rotation, um, which is probably going to be less applicable to uh, the majority of people um, listening to this. But um, we do a similar thing with the teaching shifts, uh, where you have a certain amount of shifts that are the chief resident is assigned to uh, teach you and so you they don't have any patients of their own and they uh, just see your patients with you and you get to kind of deep dive and learn um, and then um, we have uh, pig labs and cadaver labs and um, all that kind of fun stuff where you can practice procedures and um, and it's probably fairly standard across the board in terms of you know kind of showing up working with uh, the attending resident um, seeing your patients getting evaluated um, I think the real big thing is kind of figuring out like how you you fit with those people. Um, so uh, that's going to be determining your next uh, three or four years, depending on the length of the program. 
and, uh, and what kind of environment you learn in and how you get feedback and, uh, and how you grow. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of get in and fit in with people and uh, let them see who you are and see who they are and uh, see if you're a, a, a match. One, one just overall theme I would add to EM clerkships is that um, my memory is that I was always way busier when I was on my EM rotations. You know, people like, oh, fourth year, we were so free and stuff, but I did four, four aways and I was busy those months. So, you, you know, don't go in and expect like a medicine day where you get there at seven and leave at three. You're going to be there. Usually a lot of them are 12 hours. If you're at an eight hour ED, you'll be there eight or nine hours. Um, but expect to be there the whole time, show up early, and you're probably going to leave a little late after sign out. I'd like to add to that and say as someone uh, who worked uh, as an ER nurse, you know, it's, it's an environment where you, um, A, there's no, no room for ego. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of the blue collar work environment of, uh, of medicine. So I think you have to show up and uh, be willing to work and work hard. And, um, you know, you never know when things come in and you know, sometimes you got to stay late. And I think, uh, honestly, just having seen a ton of medical students come in and seeing who gets selected and who doesn't. Um, the people who showed up had a good attitude, uh, just wanted to learn, uh, you know, showed improvement in areas that they may have been weak in and uh, didn't complain and were motivated were the ones that were highly favored. So I'm sure there's a, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that go into it, but um, I think uh, that kind of attitude and, and work hard perspective can go a long way. It would seem like the, the clerkship experience can very a tad bit structurally um, but if you go into it with the right attitude and with the objective to learn a bunch and work hard you know it would seem that anyone can succeed the clerkship is one part of uh, the em experience as a medical student but there also is uh, the shelf exam uh, can anyone speak to what studying for the exam was like during the clerkship i mean i think i just went through rosh you get a lot of good training i just come off of um, a rotation and studying for steps. So I was pretty well prepared. It really depends on when you take it. Um, so I, I did pretty well on the, the shelf exam, but I think Rosh is pretty representative. Um, it's not super expensive for the 30 day pack. I think it's in the $50 range. It worked pretty well and it's approachable. It's not over the top as far as so many questions you have to complete, but that's, I mean, that's what I did and I had a good experience. Um, I had used a little bit of the Rosh review. Our uh, exam was actually an in-house exam, so it was a little different than the shelf, but I was subscribed to a, a testing program called Pass Test because um, I had just finished step two and they had extended that for COVID and they had emergency questions, so I used those as well. Um, and then my clerkship again was an in-house, so we had a study guide. Um, but a lot of the podcasts that we already addressed will help you with the material that'll be on them. And it's very much what is on step two. So if you're studying for step two, that'll cover a lot of the material, um, though it might be busy to study for step two during your clerkship. I was a big fan of pretest, which is just a book full of multiple choice questions. I use them for, I think, pretty much every clerkship I did as a third year med student and then for emergency medicine as well. But for me, going through that, just doing all the questions, I felt like that prepared me pretty well. Questions are always a favorite amongst medical students. Lauren alluded to it already, but um, step two is also something that has to be taken at some point. Um, can anyone speak to studying for step two during the EM clerkship? Um, was it crazy difficult? Uh, would you recommend someone doing it again? I had to take step two during my uh, clerkships because I, I think I started in May. I started very early and I had uh, two weeks off and I did nine blocks of UWorld every day for like two weeks and, and took step two and was totally fine, like better than step one. So it's definitely doable. I mean, maybe you don't have to do nine blocks, but I just basically like crammed it in there, studied and, and was was very fine. So you could definitely spread it out a little more, but remember what I said before, you're going to feel more busy during your EM clerkship than you ever have in medical school because your hours are going to be set and longer. So my program, my med school gave me the opportunity to have a, an elective block to study for step. So I did that the month before my clerkship. 
So I kind of used it twofold to, to go through and get ready for and take step. Um, in addition to going through all the EM resources we've already talked about and get really ready for that rotation. Um, so I think that uh, if you can avoid it during your clerkship, try to, because you know your number one goal is to make a good impression, get a good slow, and really glean what emergency medicine is all about. So that should be, you should be fully invested in learning at that moment at the clerkship and not distracted by having to take steps. So if you can separate them at any cost, try to. Yeah, I would agree with that. And actually one caveat to mine is also, or another caveat, sorry, is that most IMGs are recommended to have your step two score ready and available by the time you submit your ERAS. So that's just a little different from uh, AMGs who have a little more time to take it. I took step two in May, so I took it really early and I knew that I didn't want it to overlap with my EM clerkship, so I tried to take it as early as possible. I can't imagine studying and doing my EM clerkship at the same time, so. I did the same thing as Brianna, especially with COVID. This year, it was easier to take it while we were in lockdown, um, but it was very freeing to know I did well enough on step two to like be competitive at that point and then just focus on doing well on the clerkship. It was seem the trend is if you can knock it out, knock it out. But uh, if that step exam overlaps with your um, EM clerkship, then uh, you might want to make a great schedule because of the long hours, you know, and the difference in the EM clerkship from the other clerkship experiences. So it's something that can be budgeted, but if it can be avoided, avoid it. Away um, EM clerkships uh, are things that students often use to sort of figure out what a different uh, residency uh, at a different school would be like. Um, without a ways to compare different EDs right now, um, what should students be looking for to determine like the best fit in a specific program? Um, should they consider any specific red flags? Is there anything in residency culture during a clerkship uh, or if they can attend a clerkship at a residency they want to apply to that they should look for? I know a lot of individual programs are doing meet and greets to, in supplement of doing these away rotations. I know that we at RSA have organized a couple of regional ones with the program directors as well. And oftentimes the residents will pop in if they can. Um, so I think that, you know, using the tools you have that are available going onto the individual sites, um, emailing the programs you're specifically interested in. A lot of times they're happy to do a Zoom conference, you know, with one or two residents, one or two program leadership members and try and get a feel for their take on everything. It's, uh, I think it's, on both sides, it's difficult this year um, for programs evaluating all of you out there. You know, we're, we're having a tough time too because it's very important to kind of see how we all fit together. And um, unfortunately, the, the platforms that are available don't really give you that solid feeling of, of what somebody's like in the, in the workforce, what somebody's like outside, you know, their general personality and demeanor. So I think that, that going out, putting yourself out there and really getting to know the programs and letting them get to know you uh, through these different avenues that I've seen available. If anybody has any else, I definitely welcome those, but that's kind of a good first step. You know, it's going to be harder to gauge programs this year because it's all pretty much going to have to be done via Zoom um, unless it's your home institution. One thing that I would say that I definitely didn't really think about when I was applying, but I think is incredibly important and something I would encourage all of you to at least ask about is kind of the quality of your support staff, your nurses, your techs, your transport. Um, I remember when I was applying, I, when people would say, oh, what questions do you have? I'd ask things like, oh, well, you know, how many intubations do you get? You know, Keep in mind, guys, a program is not going to be accredited unless you get a certain number of any type of procedure. Um, so, and I see those questions a lot, asked a lot by med students um, in previous years. You know, it's going to, there are going to be some differences based on where you are, but by and large, it's going to be the same. But I didn't appreciate how much of an impact the support staff would have on my life until I actually started residency. And I got very lucky. Uh, the nurses, techs, transporters, you name it, at my hospital are fantastic. And I could not do my job without each and every one of them every single day. Um, but it's definitely something that I would encourage all of you to ask about. Um, 
because it's something that is going to impact your life a lot more than you think. And there's definitely differences. I have friends at uh, places who can't count on their support staff to do anything. And I feel very lucky to be at a place where I can and I trust them wholeheartedly and they, I, they have my back and I know um, and I have theirs. And so I would just encourage you guys to think about that and try to ask uh, that as you attend these various Zoom meet and greets or whatever they're going to be called this year. I'd like to wholeheartedly uh, second that. Having been on the flip side of it, having been the support staff before, if you run across a program that, uh, you know, it just seems like bread and butter, they're, they're going together, you know, they love their support staff, their support staff loves them, um, you know, look into it. Because if you're somewhere where, you know, you get a vibe off the either the, the residency faculty or or the support staff that they're not like jiving and getting along. Um, that's really going to affect your, your training for the next four years. And it's going to affect how much you're able to take advantage of all those opportunities uh, that, that you may be asking about. So I, I agree too. I think it, it is very, very difficult um, having done a virtual rotation. You don't, unless you're asking about those kind of things uh, you gotta, you gotta be proactive because you're not necessarily going to gleam that. Um, and even if you're spending all this time in didactics and, you know, simulated patients on zoom, um, you know, you're not always seeing them in their potentially worse moments, uh, like, like you would like to, um, see how, uh, you know, maybe they handle, uh, uh, stress in a, in a chaotic emergency department and, and vice versa when they're evaluating you. But, um, but yeah, I, I just, I, I completely agree with that. I think that, um, that's something that. Uh, a lot of people, med students don't necessarily always think about. And if you are going in person to rotate there, um, I know that, you know, people beat this into us, but really every person in that program um, has, uh, you know, maybe not like an official say, um, but there were numerous times that uh, where I worked where, you know, we would feel out a resident, see them in, or a medical student and see them in a, you know, how they really acted when they weren't trying to put on a, a, a show. And, uh, and we would pass that information along because ultimately at the end of the day, they're going to have to work with you too, because they're, they're going to be your colleagues for the next four years. And they're, they're going to play a pretty uh, important role in, in how you grow. So I just, I just wanted to support uh, what you said there. I think it was uh, excellent and something that's not always talked about. Whatever program you go to, um, whatever issues exist, uh, as far as the, the floor's dynamics, you'll inherit them as a resident. Uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Ryan. No, it's okay. Um, I think that another question and this kind of is more toward the application process, but there's a big differential between a three and a four year program. And I think that that's something you often get on the interview day and the, uh, you know, those that rotate Fresno's a four year program, you kind of see what they do in their fourth year and how it functions. But it'd be, I think it's important to kind of understand from the residents are in both a three and a four year program. What are you getting for that differential year? What is the curriculum like? How is it structured? Am I working 12 or 2012s every month, every block for the entire four years? Or is there like research time built in and, and just kind of understanding that to get a good differential as to, to the programs uh, lengths out there is important. Um, that's something I definitely asked a lot about when I was interviewing. Um, and back to what you guys were saying about the support staff, it definitely varies. I remember going on my East Coast interviews and asking people asking, how much transport do you have to do? Do you have to do your own phlebotomy? And I was, I was kind of taken aback, but I, in retrospect, I kind of understand now that those of the come from the East Coast programs uh, or different hospitals, they have, you know, you have a lot of responsibility of, of just basic patient care that I took for granted and had no idea that it existed out there. So I think that's a really good point to make is find out what the support structure is like and your inter um, specialty as well. Like how's the relationship between trauma and ED? That's an important one or cardiology and ED. And um, a lot, cause those are people you're going to be talking to for a long time, a lot of times in your residency. Um, and so you should, if it's, if it's not the best fit, you want to know. There's one final question I want to get to uh, as we as we kind of wrap up the panel. And I think this question from a panelist sort of summarizes the philosophy almost of being a medical student and completing the EM clerkship. The question is, 
I know we are all learning medicine. However, on the clerkship, we are also being evaluated and possibly the only time to do so. Um, how much am I expected to learn versus know to rock my slow, but also better train as an MD? Learn versus know. I think that one more important facet of that is how much are you teachable? I think that's the real thing people are evaluating you for. Knowledge is something that any medical educator and my program directors say this all the time. We can fill knowledge gaps. We can't fix the the people that aren't teachable, that aren't personable, that don't want to be, you know, that that don't want to absorb what we have to give you. And I think that's the more important thing that's going to be recognized when you're on your slow. On it, I mean, we expect you to to know the basics. We want you to to be comfortable with medicine and making these decisions and you know how to communicate effectively. But I think the most important thing that we look at is are you teachable? And like those red flags that Josh was talking about. You know, is there something that, that sticks out that, that you wouldn't um, necessarily thrive in residency with us? Right. I think you're expected, we're expected to teach you. You're coming there to learn. Why else are you doing your clerkship? I mean, yes, there's a little bit of an audition there, but, but um, we want you to learn. We want you to be curious and ask questions. Um, we expect you to be able to go complete an HPI, have some, differ have some differentials in mind before you go, complete an HPI, physical exam, give a presentation with those differentials. And if you give a disposition, that's, that's like a little cherry on top, but we don't expect medical students to always have a disposition for their patients. But I also would say that we don't like, I don't, I don't personally like, I'll speak for myself, when someone guesses, if I ask them a question, they just guess, like, the most, one of the most common questions you'll get in the ED because you're doing a lot of lacerations is what's the toxic dose of lidocaine and lidocaine with epi? Don't guess that. If you don't know, say, I don't know, but I'll look it up. And in general, if you don't know something, say, I don't know, but I'll look it up. Or I'll say, you say, I don't know, and I'll tell you. And then I'll say, why don't you read about this? And then let's talk about it in like 10 minutes. So I would say exactly what Ryan said. It's more important to, to be eager to learn than to know everything. And, um, you know, you'll be totally fine if you come in with a good attitude, a, a fine base of knowledge, and then um, be ready to work too. Because, well, we'll go back to this out of, out of um, title work, like putting in IVs. I'm on the East Coast, so we don't, I mean, we don't, I, I don't put in IVs on all my patients, but sometimes when I want to get things done, I just go see the patient, put an IV, draw the blood, and then tell my nurse like, hey, here's my patient, this is the plan. Um, but like if a medical student can, can get the blood when I need it and I don't have to wait for my staff who has sometimes like 20 patients and are way overwhelmed, I mean, that's an appreciated skill too. So that doesn't necessarily have to do with, um, medical knowledge is, you know, procedural knowledge. Yeah. And just to, just to kind of throw in my two cents here. Um, I know we talked a lot about earlier on, you know, being concise, uh, in your presentations, but I would argue you're kind of assessment and plan or your medical decision making, whatever you want to call that, is maybe the one spot where you should be a little more, more thorough. You know, you guys know what you know, but I, as a senior resident, as your evaluator, don't know what you know unless you tell me. Um, you know, I'd have these med, I'd have patients who had belly pain and the med student would come and say, you know, they give the presentation and then they say, well, I think it's food poisoning. And, you know, they were right, but for me, I'm looking for my med students to say, you know, I think it's food poisoning. I thought about appendicitis and I don't think it's that because of these reasons. And I thought about, I don't know, small bowel obstruction and I don't think it's this because of these reasons. You know, it, it's kind of playing the game a bit, but, you know, I, I've had to fill out way more of these medical student evaluations in the past few months than I care to count. And the thing that keeps striking me is, you know, when the med students have kind of just not fully elucidated their thought process, I feel like I can't give them a complete evaluation because the only way for me to know where your knowledge is, is for you to tell me kind of everything that you know. And like, like um, Gabe and Ryan have said, you're not going to know everything. I don't expect you to. I expect there to be a lot of learning um, because, I mean, Lord knows there was for me. Um, but, you know, we, you ha I have to know where you're starting from. 
And if you can communicate that to me or whoever you're attending or your resident is, I think you'll do very well. Keep in mind too, that you guys as fourth years at this point are probably smarter than the interns because a lot of knowledge is lost in the second half of fourth year. Um, so I'm sure all the fourth years on the calls right now are a lot stronger than I was when I started intern year. So just as a final confidence boost for you guys. I kind of echoing back uh, to what Gabe and what Greg were saying. Oftentimes, you know, we have a very, a, a lot of canned things we like to teach you. So if we ask you a question, it's because we're hoping you don't know so we can teach you something. So we welcome it. It's like, oh, what's a toxic dose of lidocaine? Excellent. I know a lot about this. Let me teach you. And it's something that we can do on shift and we're, we're looking for those opportunities to really involve you. So we're, we, you know, don't ever feel intimidated. Like, you know, oh, oh no, I'm getting pimped again. I should know this. And, you know, we're looking for the opportunities to teach you. I hate to, uh, I hate to be the back in my day guy, but um, I totally agree with like the, the line of what we're talking about. Uh, I feel like a lot of people um, come in and they, you know, there's a lot of cool people in emergency medicine doing a lot of cool stuff. And they feel like um, we kind of get the sense that you feel like you need to, you need to like prove you're one of those people right out of the gate, you know, and you need to come in, you know, being awesome, rolling into that uh, triple trauma and then turning around and uh, resuscitating that medical patient uh, all while sipping your Starbucks in your Patagonia vest. But, you know, I, I'm actually reading a book right now that I think every medical student, resident, physician should read. And it's called uh, Ego is the Enemy. And uh, it's by Ryan Holiday, who does a lot of, uh, he's into stoic philosophy and kind of packaging that in a um, easily accessible way. But I think that if you come in with this sense that, you know, you're, you're not, you're not able to ask that question. You're not able to say, you know, no, I don't, I don't know about the lidocaine toxic dose, you know, please, please teach me. Um, that is going to show, and it's going to stick out like a red thumb that like this person thinks they know everything. Um, you know, they, as you progress in medicine, I know when I, when I went to become a flight nurse, it was the most humbling experience because I was nervous going into every shift. Like, what am I going to get into? It really made me excited to go to medical school to learn more. Um, so I think that's really how you should approach it with like a thirst for hunger, um, a willingness to come in and, uh, and, and be a part of the team, you know? And, and so I, you know, don't, don't feel so much pressure on yourself to, to know everything. Um, I agree. I think that, yeah, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, y'all residents who have uh, a lot more knowledge than me, but um, it's more about like how you're thinking about it. So if you're not, you know, even if you don't arrive at the right conclusion, if you display that you've got like a thought process there and you're going somewhere and, and somebody can correct you and guide you along the way, that's the important thing. And, and also that you recognize that you don't know, you know, um, that's, that's, that's huge. And, and that, that'll really show in, in your rotation. But. 100% agree. And if you guys are at a place where you don't feel that you can ask questions or be wrong or that you're kind of put down for doing that, I would argue that that's not a place where you want to be because if they're treating you like that, chances are they treat their residents like that too. And that's just not going to be a good environment for you to learn and grow. That's a red flag. We talked about red flags before. Yeah. Uh, kind of going back to what Greg said about the MBM part, I remember my second point. For those of you out there that are kind of just getting ready to start these or are or, or looking to start them maybe next year, the, there's a thing called the spit mnemonic when you're working on your MDMs. It's something serious, something probable, something interesting, and something treatable. You know, it's, a, it's just kind of a way to run a checklist. Like we said, checklists are great to, to run through when you're developing your MDM. It's like, what is this? What are the things I need to be worried about? What is this most likely? Is there, you know, and you can throw in the interesting and treatable if you feel the need, but it just kind of keeps you very organized. And it definitely shows when a med student comes up to me and says, you know, I thought about chest pain. I don't think it's cardiac for this reason. It's most likely GERD given their prior history. I don't, it could be myocarditis or pericarditis, but EKG is normal and their pain is not positional. And you just kind of go through that. And it really is impressive when you kind of give me that logic and thinking through each one, uh, one by one. Those are really great points to, to sort of close out or ask me anything about the EM Clerkship Experience panel. I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us tonight. I guess we can give each other a round of applause. You can take it around. I wanna thank the attendees for being present tonight and for submitting your questions and participating. 
the next panel will be uh, in two Mondays. So be on the lookout for an email from the AAEM. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Good luck. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast brought to you by the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about AAEM RSA, visit the website at www.aaemrsa.org. Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine residents and students.